not part of a military unit. <laughs> Rather, it represents a civic statement, specifically a statement of a former Dutch colony, but I'll get into that there uh, later. There is extensive documentation, including when and where it was first flown, along with information about the people associated with this use. Such documentation is quite unusual for a flag surviving from this era, with the exception of yesterday's, which had, you know, to have a receipt and, um, but it was always in this one location. Unfortunately, there is not time to fully elaborate on all the details on, and much more will be available in a later paper. Um, also, there's text in many of the slides that will give additional information uh, from what I will be mentioning. In this talk, I will be introducing the community of Schenectady, New York, the folks involved, common lands that they were protesting, the construction and possible colors of the flag along the lower below the lettering or the tide lines and keep those in mind. I know all of you are aware of the other known existing or documented Liberty flags as shown here. As you can see, they're quite different from the one I am discussing. In many ways, the history of the Liberty flag is the story of Schenectady in the 18th century. And you can see Schenectady here. Its economy was mostly based on trade and Indian fares. They looked westward more than towards any coastal businesses. Its early citizens were as as home in the Mohawk villages as in their own. And for those who don't know so much about New York State history, the English presence didn't occur until four years later, but no governmental changes really occurred for another two decades or longer. Um, and that's a whole nother story. The Dutch concept and understanding of liberty was very distinct from the ideas of individual liberty that was prevalent in the English colonies. And also one of the things to take a note is that really Dutch settlers' goals were more pluralism um, than of any religious principles as within New, New England. So besides the Liberty flag, Schenectady is also known in the art world for early 18th century American portraiture. They are now scattered among many well-known museums such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art and uh, Williamsburg. Amazingly, 28 portraits are known to have survived from this community. These in portraits include many people to, that are associated with this flag. In fact, our discussion begins with Nicholas Veter, whose grandparents are here. <laughs> Veter was a veteran of the Revolutionary War. According to local lore, he was 15 or 16 when he joined towards the end of the war in the year 1777. Official documents are lacking, but we know of his service from his own accounts. The earliest known image of the Liberty flag is here in 1860. It appears in and is prominent feature with the only known image of Mr. Veter. He appears besides it, suggesting that it is his property. He, of course, is wearing his Revolutionary War uniform. In the background, you can see the old Veter fort. The same newspaper article also included this image of the inside of his fort, which is really miraculous. It mentions the items that actually he collected on, and it was a personal museum, as you can imagine. The other players in the story, of course, also have portraits. Meet John Sanders and his wife, Deborah Gleck. It is their grandson, Judge John Sanders, who allowed Nicholas to carry the flag annually on Fourth of July parades. And of course, he's wearing his uniform. The Sanders lived in Deborah's family's large stone house across the river from the stockade. The land was purchased three years prior to the stockade's establishment. A question of why the Sanders had the flag. Well, either John Sanders himself or Henry Glenn kept the flag for safekeeping as each of them were justice of the peace at the time. The next important character is the story of Sir William Johnson. He's a loyalist, a first bayonet, 
have, he having learned the Mohawk language and Iroquois customs, he was appointed in 1756, the British superintendent of Indian affairs for all Northern colonies. Johnson came to the Mohawk Valley from Ireland as a land agent for his uncle, but soon he acquired a vast estate of his own from the Mohawk. Um, quick fact, it was actually Johnson who renamed a certain body of water uh, from French to uh, Lake George in memory of his king. Remember earlier I mentioned a bait of the common lands. The rising of the first Liberty flag and pole was a land protest in 1771. John Sanders, John Baptist, Van Epps, both wrote a letter to Johnson and told him of the flag raising and the protest. No apparent uh, records or documentation is known to have survived or is known that Johnson uh, responded. This slide shows the size of the second land purchase in 1670 from the Mohawks by five town trustees. The land was available only because the Mohawks conflict with the Algonquin tribe had caused the latter to abandon these lands west of the Hudson River. Disputes over how the trustees managed the common lands began almost immediately and remained unsettled uh, for a century. And in fact, the Revolutionary War and actually just it all fizzled out. This, as stated in the letter, the Liberty flag was raised on a pole at Ferry. The pole was about 20 feet tall and was put up by the citizenry, not the trustees of the town. OK, so that's all the background like the clip notes. <laughs> so here's the flag. And this is how I saw it in 2000. And it was sandwiched between two sheets of thick glass. Uh, it was possibly uh, mounted this way in the 50s. This almost complete silk flag is constructed of a single width of fabric. You wanna note the upper and lower edges are salvages. And also, um, as mentioned yesterday, Silk at this time came from England. So three points to mention besides what is written here. One is the hoist is detached, the lettering, of course, and then the tide lines, as I mentioned before. First, the hoist was separated with, and I saw no original stitching threads on uh, that were still present. Regular spaced holes are present along the center of the hoist, whether they were created from nails, um, or simply from abrasion really isn't fully understood. The hoist would have been folded over creating a sleeve, which is a common uh, flag attachment. As I were working out the history of the flag, the method of how flags are attached to Liberty poles came up. The hoist measures only three and a half inches wide and that's flat, clearly not wide enough to wrap around the diameter of the pole. But perhaps flags were first attached to the pole while being on an auxiliary pole or rope before it was raised vertically. And this is a possible research project for anyone. Now to the lettering, which is present on both sides. This is the reverse side and is created with narrow white plain weave silk ribbons, which are also called tape or lace at the time. Each letter measures three and a half inches high and is constructed of multiple small pieces of ribbon. Silk ribbon was a common domestic item found for everyday use. Ribbon manufacturing was more expensive than just thread, but the use of ribbon was much easier and was a faster technique than embroidery for the same size lettering. Three techniques were found to form each letter. They are flat, folded in half lengthwise, or folded into triangles. Simply to create the letter L, four separate small pieces are needed for each side of the flag. Small pieces, very expensive material, hence items would be saved and get collected. It is highly likely that the lettering was created from small saved scraps. Even the larger support fabric 
could have been a remainder of an unused fabric. We know the width of the fabric because of the selvage. However, the saved silk could have determined the actual flag's width. So to its color, great debate. Was it blue or was it green? Well, this is a quote from a trusted early textile specialist and weaver who said, if it was blue, it would always be blue. So a dye analysis hopefully will be done in the future, perhaps, but without testing, a color might be determined. And here is a list of natural dyes that were available in England. At the time, creating green was still a two bath technique, but not soon after a single bath would have been used. So we have woad, logwood, indigo, Prussian blue. Remember Prussian blue from yesterday? So soon after the pigment was developed, a dye uh, was also developed. And then our common yellow dyes. Additional evidence of the early change in the color are here from the mending threads that are similar in color of the silk flag, representing that the flag was an early has an early color shift and low dye quality. These mending threads really, I think, were added even before it was previously mounted, if it was in the 50s. So using fading research with blue wool standard cards of various dyes, we can rule out the blues. The ranking is one to eight, and eight, seven, and eight is the highest light fastness. Hence is why indigo blue, woad, all those we would like those colors. But Prussian blue, also called indio, indigo carmine, is a very low light fast. Plus its color change is from blue to green to yellowish as it ages. It also is fastness to water, exposure to water is quite low. And perhaps it's the Prussian blue that has contributed to those large tide lines in the lower third of the flag. For the yellow dye, it's less clear. Several options are possible for the yellow component. One is fustic, which gives only a moderate degree of light fastness, even when mordant with alum and tin. Yet when copper and iron, fustic has a better light fastness. The other yellow candidate is weld. Uh, due to the fact that the flag is a brownish color, weld is a possible option. If the flag is the flag mentioned in the letter of 1771, it was not part of a protest against British taxation, as has been suggested, but rather part of a protest of a newer English inhabitants against contemporary control of common lands by the local Dutch descendants. During this research in the history of the flag, two important facts became clear about how easily the historical truth, to the extent that we can understand it, can be confused with myth that can be taken as plausible. First, all early articles and books that mention the flag are linked to the widely acknowledged anger over taxation policies of the co colonial power. This might not be the case. Also, I want to say that what is in a photograph is not the complete story. By having a single image of an artifact with a person does not necessarily mean that the person was the owner of that specific artifact, as has in the case widely been assumed. Each of these misconceptions is currently being repeated at the Museum of American Revolutionaries website celebrating the display of the Liberty flag mounted adjacent to the Forster flag. If nothing else, we can be sure that this flag was specifically important to those who made it and preserved it intact, that it calls out to us from a time we may have intended to oversimplify. I have many people to thank with this research. As I say, no good work can be done alone. And I thank you and I hope people have questions. <laughs> Oh, okay, so why only blue or green? Okay, so bl why only blue and yellow versus other dye stuffs? Um, so I, 
I did not know. There's so much that I, anyway. So it turns out Schenectady had two militias. And it's recorded that they had a flag, each had flags that said Lither, liberty and death, much like the ones that we know, okay? There's no way there was a death in this flag. The militias, the two, one was blue and one was green. So we can kind of rule out that the, plus red, you know, it just doesn't work. <laughs> It would be mordant, and I, it would be matter, and that's like indigo. It doesn't fade. Oh, great. I love, why was it in English? Which is a, a whole slide I had to eliminate. Anyway, yes, Dutch was prevalent in um, this region of the, the Mahomoc Valley, even in Albany, where I'm from, um, up until the night, like, the 1900s, um, and in fact, I actually treated, that was gonna be the slide, um, a document from a church, a reformed, you know, Dutch church um, that's very close to Schenectady, and it was a vote from 1816, and they were voting about the serm what language the sermon would be in of changing from Dutch to English. Okay, so that's like 40 years later. What is known is that the Dutch and the English would correspond in their own language. So English, the English would write in English and the Dutch would write in Dutch, but never mixed. And the Dutch language of that region is, is like a fossil. Any person from Holland that comes now hasn't a clue what these words are because we the, this Dutch was sort of encapsulated and never uh, changed. Um, I have a lot more to say about that. See, this is where I'm not a historian, I'm a conservator. But I think the initial lands were but bought by the Dutch. Well, both patents were d bought by the Dutch. But by the time of 1670, actually, by the, the first governor of New York State was an English person. And in 1880s, he kind of enforced rules on this underlying Dutch method. And in fact, that patent is called, named after him. Um, and so that was part of the whole struggle and because nothing ever, there were lawsuits and, and I really don't understand it fully. Mm -hmm.